Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Bullet Brawl. Today is May 13th. Lucky number 13 if you ask me. We're going to start the show right now with some games with a player that... Um, those of you who watched the show last week know that we had a little bit of technical difficulties to start. Some weird bugs going on with the pre-moves in certain browsers. We ended up having an uh, immediate team meeting and live team because they're awesome. Jumped on it and fixed it right away. But it kind of ruined the experience for this guy right here, Andrew May, the eye doctor who won one of our hashtag chess anywhere contests. And so I'm going to play him a couple times just to start. He's been looking forward to this all week. Like a uh, like Manny Pacquiao waiting for his rematch against Floyd Mayweather, but unfortunately, just like Pacquiao Mayweather, it'll be the same result. Uh, not because Pacquiao's not capable, but because never mind, boxing is corrupt. And now now we're on a uh, now we're on a tangent that really is not relevant to this situation. So um, okay, let's play the Trumpowski and see how Andrew fares against this. We will play e4. Uh, well, g6 is, is not so bueno. Unprotecting the knight twice is going to lead to a loss of that piece. We'll take, we'll trade everything, pre-move knight f3. Probably we're going to try to get castled long and put the queen on h6 and drive the h-pawn. Think fast on your toes, and that's, uh, that's how you'll get the best results in bullet. We're going to drive that h-pawn, and if we get a chance, we're going to come in with the queen and uh, open things up. Now it's a little bit messy for him because he'd like to play f6 to open up the queen, but then g6 falls. Unfortunately, if he doesn't, I'm going to play knight to g5 now. Uh, probably his best will be to play f6 anyway, and the question will be should I take on g6, takes g5, and then takes h7? What's irritating about that is I, is I don't even have an immediate follow-up there that's just, you know, winning. Um, I guess I'm going to do it anyway. And after he takes it, I'm going to... I'm going to play this move, bishop to d3. Okay, he, he goes this way, which probably isn't as good as even just taking that knight. But it's easy to be worried when your king is under fire. Understandable for sure. I'm going to try to do a rook lift now and come around and maybe maybe deliver some goods on the g file. But, uh, okay, he takes d4. Not so good. Not so good. Holding his own now. He wants to get the h7 pawn. That was good. I'll solidify that pony there. And then uh, after I protect the f2 pawn, oops, could have taken his rook. I'm going to come over here and go get the a pawn. That's my big idea right now. At this point, it's about time to just start pre-moving and get a flag. Okay, so for Andrew, one of the other things that wasn't working last week was the ability to back up and take a look at these games. Um, obviously, that's one of the things that a lot of players like about the brawls. Not just the, they don't just come for the for the snacks and the environment. You know, they don't just come for the ambiance and the trash talk. They actually want some instruction. Go figure. Um, so okay, th unfortunately for this one, this is just a uh, a very quick loss. I mean, the Trumpowski has the default or the. Uh, the defunct, the, the bad thing, that if, if black plays h6 here as he should, after h6, white has to give up the bishop pair or avoid or uh, or drop the uh, the e-pawn. So white takes it, and you get these positions where white has a big center, but black has the two bishops in compensation, and the position is relatively equal. A uh, fun dynamic game, but pretty much equal. And so, um, you know, with g6 immediately, it's basically just a bullet blunder, and I don't think he really needs to be reminded of that. e5 is is now just completely crushing, and, and he was just down a piece. So not really much to say for that. We're going to we're gonna send him a rematch because he deserves it before we move on, and then we're going to uh, open up the door after that. All right, Andrew, we're rooting for you right now. We're rooting for you to have a delicious game, a big game. Sorry about that. I'm slightly distracted for the moment. All right. Okay, we have a Nimzo Indian. I'm down a few more seconds on time than I would normally like. With uh, bishop to g5, I'm tempted to at some point bring my bishop back to e7 and transpose into, into a qgd. e4 is not a bad idea normally if you can change the structure, but the knight is just pinned. So, again, a little bit premature. 
one of the things that's difficult when you feel a little bit outmatched as far as uh, speed, you're, you're focused on making faster moves rather than making good moves. But good moves should still be the number one priority. Support the D-pawn because why not? We'll back up and talk a little bit about the structure as far as how that middle game might have gone if he hadn't blundered the knight on f3 or blundered the pawn on e4. As soon as we can play fast enough to, uh, to make sure that we get the win make sure that we get the win because he's uh he's playing fast here gotta respect that gotta respect that too many pawns not enough time i always say i actually don't normally say that but i did just now okay Open up for the idea of doing something on e1. Okay, he resigned. He played queen to b8 check and then immediately saw that the queen is actually hanging here, so he resigned. Uh, okay, so this this Nimzo Indian is a good one for white, and you guys can, can certainly consider playing this way. Um, sorry, Andrew. You, you did great. You did great. Don't be upset. I mean, no, you didn't play that well. <laughs> but what are we supposed to do? I actually, uh, one of my teammates told me that... Um, that he uh, he met somebody at the not the World Open but the Philadelphia Open and uh, he met somebody who said that they really don't like me because they said that Danny Wrench always makes fun of low rated players and I said well first of all I'm flattered uh, no but uh, I said first of all no that's not the point of this we're here to have fun and and obviously chess is uh, there's certainly plenty of times where I lose in uh, giving the giving commentary while playing and also the main point is to go over these games and and uh learn from our mistakes but in a way that maybe leaves a mark so sometimes we like to have fun about what happened because it helps helps us remember things but seriously i mean i guess i'm not as bad of a guy as my reputation proceeds you know is preceding me but maybe i am you guys don't know that's what's fun um okay well uh bishop to b4 um uh, Nimzo Indian and after knight f3, which is a popular move order. Not as popular these days at the highest level, but but popular and, and, and logical, of course. And after castles, bishop to g5. I think that uh, the the disciplined or principled move most of the time for, for black is, is to play either c5 or b6. Both those moves are, are more Nimzo-esque theory. Um, and... After b6, one of the common one of the common ways to play the position is actually bringing the knight to d2 immediately, which unpins the knight, but most importantly prepares e4. Because what white should be looking to do uh, philosophically here in these bishop, when you get the bishop to g5 pinning the knight in these nimzos, is is look to expand in the center to to take advantage of the pin, and that's actually what Andrew tried to do. He just did it later on in a in a way that didn't work tactically, um, and so. B6 is a move that can be met by knight to d2 and go for knight e4, and, and we have a uh, well-known well known position, actually. The theory there, I've played that position, I think, against Eugene Perelstein a couple times. He's an author of ours, and um, some of the Georgian grandmasters like that system, guys like Kachishvili and others. So uh, that's one thing to do. The other thing I can do is play c5, which is also a very Nimzo-esque Nimzo -esque type move, and it opens up the dark squares to try to put pressure here, which also kind of is, is an attempt to expose that development. But uh, when I play d5, I play d5 a lot in blitz, and I think it's I think it's just because it's the first pawn that pops into my brain, to be honest with you. I don't think there's any deeper reason than that. And um, But once you do play d5, you know, after e3 and c6, there's not really any way to argue that, that white isn't just a little bit better here, because this is a queen's gambit declined. This is a QGD with the bishop pinning the knight to the queen, and, and this bishop here is, is honestly sort of misplaced in a lot of lines, unless... Unless I make the effort to transpose into like a Cambridge Springs. What's a Cambridge Springs? Well, okay, after queen to c2, knight b to d7, if a, if a move like bishop to d3 is played, um, we are in a, a Cambridge Springs, which is a system where black plays aggressively on the queen side, but often because there's tactics here. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, one of the ideas is that... Um, that in a lot of positions we're, we're going to be opening up this this fifth rank and this bishop will be falling. Uh, so this is not exactly Camber Springs theory here, but it, it is um, 
it is an idea for black to kind of justify the development of the bishop on b4 instead of the bishop being on e7 which strategically the bishop on e7 serves more purpose for the greater good in most queen's gambits than it does on b4 where it's often just giving itself up and, and black is going down the bishop pair so um a little bit over generalizing but but it's true and that those that those um uh, those themes are are relevant and you know, my opponent, again, playing e4 makes sense as a way to, to try to use the bishop. So he has this idea in mind. That's good. But, you know, tactically, you're just very premature because the knight is pinned. And so after I take it, you know, there really wasn't much else to it. You're just losing that pawn. If you play knight to d2, probably the position is salvageable, um, maybe even more than salvageable. I mean, like if I play h6 and try to unpin it and we get some sort of big trade, I don't know, but maybe I can take on d4 before taking e4 and letting you take with the queen. So... You know, but it, it, we're obviously we're trying to justify just a blunder that was a bad move based on the fact that the knight was pinned. So uh, I tried to go out of my way, Andrew, obviously to give a little more philosophy of, on the theory here uh, with the the transposition to the QGD structure we did from the Nimzo and some other stuff. And I hope some of that is beneficial. Maybe not. Bullet may not be your forte. It's not my forte either, believe it or not. I just get paid to blunder. That's the difference. So I can get up here and get paid whilst acting like an idiot. So that that's just a job perk I have. Uh, but everybody else who may not necessarily do as well at blunder uh, at blundering or you know financially, I do well when I blunder. You know, I'm up here to, I'm up here to to do that. Um, you know, I understand that bullet can be tough. So, but seriously, thank you for playing the hashtag chess anywhere contest for all those of you who didn't even know the content exi contest existed. Um uh, Well, that's too bad. So, all right, here we do it. Here we do it. Let's do it. Let's uh, let's go boys to men on this. This is how we do it. Let's get some bullet games going here. We'll start with Smarter Chess, Candidate Master. Smarter Chess, one of the uh, follows me on Twitter, requested, requested a game. If you want to follow me on Twitter, of course you can, at Daniel Wrench. Normally we are uh, tweeting and having a blast, if, if it's possible to have a blast on Twitter. That's what we're doing. I'm going to stop bishop to b4 because that's kind of a critical way they normally develop in this line. So here we're just making some some standard looking moves, getting developed. I take with the e pawn because even though it's a doubled pawn, they control a lot of critical center squares. And the main idea is that it keeps the knights out of those squares. And in some cases, uh, when a piece goes to f5, the pawns are going to become undoubled anyway. Let's see if he wants to take it. He does. And so we've got this... Nice, massive pawn center here. I kind of like it. I'm not going to lie. I really like it, actually. So the pawns will slowly get undoubled, and with it, hopefully, come some tactics against the black king in the center. Um, that's that's what I think we're, uh, we're headed toward, some tacticos here. Uh, knight to c6. If he takes, I'm going to take with the rook. We're happy about that. Um, I, think, uh, I think b6 and then f6 is falling. The London Bridge is falling. Wasn't that a song when we were kids? The London Bridge is falling? I think so. I say when we were kids, right? As if we're all the same generation here. So I have to be a little careful here. He's getting he's getting some counterplay, actually. He's getting much more counterplay than I ever, ever would have desired him to get. Uh, I'm actually probably losing now, to be honest. I'm just making some moves. Maybe he wants a draw, huh? Okay, he's going to take and then give check. And we're going to take there and then take and then give that check. All right, well, not, not the best technique, certainly, down the stretch. Not the best play by, uh, by any of us. But okay, he had his first chance. That's what he said. <laughs> first chance in a bullet game against me. No, you've actually had some really good games. Um, all right, so I'm going to play this weird C5 move order, even though I'm not a Benko player. I don't know why I keep doing that in bullet. But we have a Benko Benoni. We probably could have backed up and taken a look at some of the instructional value of that game, but too late now. Okay. All right, here we go. Here we go. Rock and roll. I'm going to put tactics on the queen, hopefully. Uh, if she backs up, what am I playing for here strategically? I'd like to I'd like to open up 
the position or, or just keep it open for the bishops. I'd like to put the knight on d4. Um, I'd like to not blunder pawns. So that's priority number one, but I failed at that. So unfortunately, um, unfortunately, by failing at that, I have uh, opened the door for my opponents. But let's keep the attack on, right? The bishop is actually a really irritating piece here for white. Creating a lot of threats on the diagonal. Okay. We'll play a4, maybe even play a3 next if we can. Or we'll go take that pawn. I guess so. Uh, should we take another pawn? I don't even know what we should be doing here. I guess we can. So we should, huh? Ooh, he's taking. I mean, he's... Uh, I'm getting down on time, so I definitely have to be a little careful here. Playing fast because it's bullet. That's what we're doing. All right. Taking two, but the best of five is not over yet. Smarter Chess is pushing me to the limit right now. I need to play a quality game here. I don't feel real great about the quality of my chess here. Look at that. It's weird how the piece gets stuck like that. It's been happening a lot lately with our new boards, but it's hard to always report on those kind of bugs, but they are happening. Unfortunately, I think that the tactic of taking on c4 loses a piece for my opponent. Um, it's actually kind of a common trick in this line. We'll back up and take a look at it. Ooh. Ooh, this is getting exciting. This could be my first quality game so far in this little mini match between me and Smarter Chess. Matt, Matt Jensen, I think, follows me on Twitter, like I said, but he's uh, an awesome member here on our site. Does a lot to help out in different areas, too. So we love Matt. We love you, Matt. I love you. I love you. I love you. Um, all right, we're going to prevent F4. As, oh, I just blundered the rook. So that's not good. Yeah, that didn't help anybody's, didn't help anybody's chances there. That move I just played. By anybody, I mean me. Didn't help my chances, and I'm... Kind of a selfish guy, so um, that was frustrating. But luckily for me, the position is still pretty unclear overall, honestly. Even with that blunder. The blunder of a rook, and you're still probably winning. It's always nice. It's a nice sign. All right. Play a4. A lot of pawns. Not a lot of time for my opponent. Oop, I bluttered my rook. That's fun. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um in the opening here, this is a okay, this 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 is a Carol Khan, a pan up Advent Carol Khan, and, and this is often gonna reach isolated queen pawn positions. But the main thing that happened in the middle game was that um okay, knight c six is probably not the best move right here if I was paying more attention in bullet than than I um paying more attention than I was. I think that I wonder if I should con even consider taking the pawn and then trying to get initiative. One of the themes you're you're always striving for as you transition into a middle game, if you have a structure where the tension is eventually going to break and you're going to be left with an isolated queen pawn, you want to make sure you're developing your minor pieces with a couple of things in mind. First thing is to avoid trades because minor piece trades tend to uh, take away your chances to use the active squares that your pawn is controlling. Uh, also, major piece endgames are the easiest for someone to barrel up against your isolated queen pawn. Just hashtag pro tip. And the second thing you want to do is not just avoid trades, but, but develop your pieces to squares where they can access the open diagonals and files that inherently you have in an IQP. So, so if you have the idea to take and maybe get a quick development, you, you should consider it. 
but okay, I played knight. I played uh, knight c3, and after knight f6, we transposed to the the classical pan of Budvinic. Knight f3 is the move that's been played most often, but on a more modern theory level, bishop g5 is a little more popular. Uh, and I'm immediately, of course, putting pressure here to take d5. e6 and bishop e6 are both moves. My opponent plays bishop e6. If you think that looks awkward, like the old lady who swallowed the fly, you know, blocked the pawn, who blocks the bishop, who prevents from castling, it's a little bit of a chain reaction, but the point is that the, the center structure is not going to maintain itself. At some point, white's going to take here, and when they do, black can take back either way and is going to be able to complete development. And this bishop is... is uh, is placed with a purpose there. So anyway, it's not as simple as just that's an awkward move that blocks a center pawn. Uh, but after knight f3, now, what is the move here? I think he's supposed to play knight e4. What am I... What exactly am I forgetting? Knight, e, knight e4 is a move. I think queen to d7 is a move. It moves that naturally prepare to open up the position, as we said. You have to have an eye on not only the pawn structure that's in front of you, but what you're transitioning to, so that so that um, so that black can take and and eventually have pressure on the pawn. But d takes c4 right away is just a tactical blunder due to the fact that I'm I'm just winning a piece here, and it's kind of a common trap in this line. I'm trying to remember the move. Oh, you know what? I think I played knight f3, which is a mistake, because of knight to e4. The move, the theoretical move here I think I'm supposed to play is actually a3, which, okay, still prevents d takes c4 because of this, you know, the tactic that we had in the game, but it's sort of a prophylactic move against the coming ideas of queen a5 and knight e4 because you're either going to get b4 or you guard the square. Ah, and, and now that as I talk about the position, I think I remember that the, the main move is actually queen a5 here, which threatens knight e4 and rook to d8. So against knight f3, queen a5 is the best move, actually. Um, I'm, I'm more and more sure of that now. By the way, that little process I just went through as far as how I remembered the theory is should be very beneficial to all of you because when I was teaching, you know, when I was teaching full-time professionally, when it was all I did, you know, teaching private lessons and an after-school programs and, and this sort of thing, group sessions, uh, you know, you always deal with people who really want the chance to um, improve their openings, and improving their openings, usually they associate to memorization. Like, I just can't remember all these lines, and so they either avoid mainline theory because they convince themselves by having this whole conglomerate of sidelines, there's less for them to study in the opening, and they can trick people, but... If they, if they use that approach and actually get to a higher level, now they're facing people where that sort of becomes a problem. Um, but what I'm getting to is this. Usually the way you figure out the opening theory is by trying to remember and analyze the position, not by trying to like pull a rabbit out of the hat like, like I was first doing, where I was like, what's the move here? And I just couldn't remember it, right? It just doesn't come back to you. But if you just engage yourself in analyzing the position and, and start to think about what both sides are trying to do and you just start to naturally calculate then what happens is suddenly something clicks and you remember all the opening theory that you didn't remember before especially someone like me who's i'm not as you know studying recent opening theory as much as i used to when i was playing professionally so um but it's just a good piece of advice that if you're pushing yourself to expand your opening repertoire, you're studying lots of variations, and you get in an over-the-board setting, and you have trouble remembering your lines, often it could be that you have the wrong approach, that you're trying, like I said, to remember the lines magically, as if, if you just sit there long enough and make enough you know, faces that make you look like you're smelling something awful, it'll just come back. Well... Pro tip, it doesn't come back that way, okay? Uh, and, and the way it comes back, and I've done this in, you know, even really complicated lines of, like, Nidorf theory, English attack. You're, you're analyzing on move 20, like, and, and you actually don't even think you're in opening theory anymore. You're analyzing the position, and you're struggling to evaluate what the right plan is in the middle game. You really know that you're in a critical moment to make the right decision for where the game's going to head. And as you're doing that, you start thinking about the position, and all of a sudden, I'm like, wait. Wait, I remember this position. I actually know exactly what the move is here. And I've studied this line about another 10 moves deeper than I thought. So, and, and I tell my students that, I used to tell my students that, and, and the, the couple people I work with rarely on a private basis, I tell them that. You know, the right way to improve your, basically, the right way to improve your memorization of an opening is to understand the position. 
the better you understand the middle game and are familiar with the tactics, the harder it will be for you to forget what moves you're supposed to play because you just understand the position and it will come back to you. So don't quote lines like it's scripture, John Paul this, whatever. Like Dive into it and trust that as you work and, and improve your opening repertoire and start to really push yourself to understand the common formations and tactics that occur in the middle games from your openings, you will remember opening lines better. So there you go. That's my That's my rant for the day. And hopefully that is something that can be useful to you those of you who are studying and trying to get better. So, okay, we got a lot of others. I'm going to accept the match of Jornification, who is a, uh, I think, someone who helps out a lot on this site. Um, at least the username I, I uh, recognize. And Jornification sent me a message on Twitter about a couple hours ago and asked me if, if he could play. Um, there's some people following me and tweeting at me right now. Go ahead and jump in. I see uh, Julius M. Berg. Uh, I see you are on, and Jornification likely forgot. So here we're doing it. Ding, 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 bullet simultine. Here we go, buddy. You just followed me on Twitter and tweeted at me just for that chance to play. How can I say no? Okay, well, uh, looks like Jornification abandoned the game. So if he comes back, I'll uh, I'll go ahead and send him a rematch. Come on, Julius M. Berg, let's do this. All right, you're here. You're here. We're all excited. I'm excited. You're excited. Everyone's excited. Uh, we would have been more excited if you had played d5. Now we're really excited about your position, but for the wrong reasons for you. I'm going to play h4. This is probably the trash talk that got me in trouble with that person who said that Danny Wrench was just a big meanie head. But uh, we're here to have fun and entertain. I will not justify my behavior. No, I'm kidding. But probably she just watched one of those one shows where I was like making fun of somebody and like, just decided I was a horrible person, which I get. I'm certainly somebody who judges somebody based on the first action I see of them, right? I and I judge them harshly. Don't you forget it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's take on uh, Virginio. Virginio 16 sounds like an Italian name. Virginio, right? Probably the modern name of someone who runs the mafia, right? Where we've moved out of the names of uh, who were some of the names who ran the mafia back in The Godfather. I mean, Michael we know was the main one, but I want to say, like, Vasilio and uh, something like that. I don't know. All right. I see uh, I see tweeting your username at me there, some others. I will uh, try to work you in. All right. We have a Karakon, a mainline Karakon, in fact. A lot of these players are just not paying attention to the fact that their game is getting accepted and then they're down time. But there's nothing I can do about that. you got to bring your A game. Go big or go home. Knight up two is hanging. He could win my uh, win the exchange, and he can still do it, but not anymore. Now I'll guard it. All right, let's put this knight on e5. If he, I was gonna say if he takes, maybe we'll take and then pin the knight to d5, but he doesn't take. Correctly so, likely. And uh, we'll trade and then bring the knight to e4 to threaten g5. Okay, I have an idea of getting something against the e6 pawn, but I want to remove my king from getting checked first. Prophylaxis first. Prophylaxis killed the cat. It wasn't curiosity after all. Turns out it was prophylaxis. I know, right? Mind blown. Like, whoa, Danny, I've been basing my whole life on the theory that curiosity killed the cat. Now you tell me it's prophylaxis and chess. Yep, there you go. You're welcome. All right, I, I'm just missing... Missing one win after the other here, but okay. Uh, so we started out with a um, a standard Karakon. This is a classical, and, and it's uh, it's all good stuff up until about here. See, the issue is that H maybe he mouse slipped. I don't know, but H four threatens H five. But you you really have to um, you really have to play H six here. It's the only real option. I'm going to turn down the uh, the volume here for the tweets coming in, so we don't irritate everybody. Um, the point is that this bishop is going to be traded for white's bishop on the light square diagonal, mainly because the bishop is a very good piece, uh, appearing into, uh, into white's queen side, where I plan to put the king, and it's a very active piece. So strategically, it's in white's interest to make this trade. White does not in all the classical Karakhan. So if you play h5, you're creating a situation where when that bishop gets traded, you're going to have a little bit more weaknesses on the king side than you bargained for. Whereas h6, for example, after the main line happens like this, 
Um, or actually, sorry, white normally plays knight f3. I should play the theory correctly and then bishop d3. But in this variation, um, though the pawn is extended, which can sometimes lead to, to the potential for an attack on the king side, black does not have a lot of weaknesses on this side of the board. You know, the structure is very solid. Uh, but in, in a situation with the pawn on h5, you're, you're, um, we'll get to that position. In the situation with the pawn on h5, you, uh, you have a target. And it also gives me access to the g5 square for the knight or a bishop, and, and that makes my life pretty easy as far as getting access to squares on the on the uh, the king side. So white white should really be much better here already. Uh, but in this position, I just blundered, castling long and allowed him to take on f2, which he missed. Probably I should play rook f1 and guard the pawn, and then and then get back to similar types of uh, positions we got in the game, where if we pretend that I didn't just blunder that pawn and maybe we get a transposition, like if I had played rook f1 first and then done castles long on queen b3. I think that this position is just really tough for black. Uh, B6, not a great move. These pawns are weak. And, and again, this whole plan with h5 and knight g4 is just not ideal. So, okay, we have uh, another person tweeting at me whose name I can't pronounce, but he did tell me his name on chess.com. So we'll see if I can find his, yep, find his username. There you go. F Sun. F F S U Nicholas Lewis. Okay, so he's probably a Florida State University student whose name is Nicholas Lewis. You literally just told us half the things we need to commit identity theft against you. Okay, why don't you rethink your new username there, buddy? No, I'm kidding. First of all, identity theft is a horrible, horrible crime, and I'm not condoning that at all. I mean, seriously, it's probably the, the most modern form of something horrible. But you guys got to pay attention to when a game starts. I mean, seriously, you got to pay attention to your own game starting because you're losing 20 seconds and you can't afford that against me. So everybody is uh, everybody's here and excited, and then they ask me to accept their challenge, and then I do, and then they lose 20 seconds on their clock. What am I supposed to do about that? What am I supposed to do about that? All right, I'm up a pawn in the Sicilian. Oh. I just blundered a pre-move, but it turns out it's probably going to be okay, because if he takes the rook, I can take with check. I expected him to take back on b1, but uh, that's one of those funny times where you pre-move a blunder and it ends up not making a difference, so that's fun. That's a rare, a rare occurrence when a pre-move blunder doesn't lose the game on the spot. So, okay, we move forward here. Uh, how should we, how should we deliver the goods? Queen check, I guess, seems to do the trick. A mate in three. One, two, three. That's always fun. You hear that, uh, you hear that noise in the background? All that is is probably another, you know, sports center alert about the latest crime that the New England Patriots have committed. But um bum shh, right? Way to go, Patriots. Really. All right. Okay, well, let's keep going. Um, some other players coming in. Let's take on Ryan Murphy 5. Welcome to the show, Ryan Murphy 5. I'm just glad you're not Ryan Murphy 6, because, you know, that'd be weird. Okay. No? Yes? No? I probably shouldn't start another game and risk the, uh, the bullet simul, should I? At this point, everybody's been 20 seconds late, so doing so would be risking it big time. But I'm going to. <laughs> All right, look at that. Bullet simul commencing. We'll see if the other guy comes along. We have a dragon going here, which we feel really good about. Oh, he's here. We have a game. We have a bullet brawl simul, everybody. This is how champions are born. It's actually not. It's how dreams are destroyed. Because this usually never works out for anybody. Most of all, me. Although, once again, I do have a winning position on both boards, which is pretty typical of uh, these bullet simuls these days. Okay, we'll try to take advantage of the pin. Get castled. Okay, we'll take there. We'll play d4. We're up a lot. We're up a lot of stuff right now. Uh, but being up a lot of stuff... Never got anybody anything but a big pat on the back. You gotta win the game, baby. You got to win the game. 
Ryan Murphy called it quits. He's down pieces. That means I'm down to just one, and I think uh, I think we're going to see another bullet simul victory. Down to just one game, and that game is an easy win. I'm going to double rooks on the e file and try to go deliver a checkmate. All right. Well, that was fun. This dragon was actually kind of interesting, bullet simul or not. We have a mainline uh, Yugoslav attack, and I want to remind myself of where I went wrong because this is, um, yeah, this is all this is all normal stuff. And this ten king to be one line. One of the most popular ways to play this line is the way that I consistently don't play in these bullet games, and that's actually to take on d4, and then after e5, which is sort of the key intermezzo in this line. If white takes back on d4 with the queen, you have this discovery, and black's winning. And if black takes with the bishop, you're taking here, and again, black has uh, everything he wants. I mean, he's gotten d5, which is a very easy move, uh, or a no-brainer move to play in the Sicilian if you can get away with it. Uh, so white has to play this intermezzo, and the main line goes like this, with knight f5 takes, takes, and after knight d5, black is actually sacrificing the queen most of the time. And following that with an idea to rook lift over here, where maybe the, the rook and the two bishops create some pressure as, as a form of compensation. But uh, there's a few ways for white to play to get an edge, but both of them, or, or all of them, involve a key maneuver here for white. So I'm giving you guys some dragon theory. Recognizing your opponent's plan and that uh, that will lead to some long-term pressure should, should enable you to think about a developing move here for white that leads to a simplification down the road, even though it seems to be awkward at first and lose time. That's bishop to b5. And the whole point is that even if black gains some tempos attacking the bishop, the relocation of this bishop to this diagonal, which eliminates one of black's key attacking pieces, is much more irritating for black uh, than anything else. Because without the two bishops working together, black is probably not going to have compensation for the queen in this line. So after bishop to b5, white will uh, run into rook d8 in here, and then you know the position gets messy. But white should probably be a little bit better in this, in this line. Um, and so that's why I don't play that stuff anymore. If white really knows what they're doing, I just don't like that endgame. I don't like being down my queen. All right, sue me. You know, I like my queen. Deal with it. Uh, everyone just, uh, half the people in Vegas just lost money. Like, would Danny take a sip of his obnoxious gallon of water 20 minutes, uh, the over-under is about 20 minutes into the show. Does he take a sip of it before or after the 20-minute mark? So all those of you who took the under, I apologize. You just lost money. I waited till over 20 minutes. So e5 is is um, the move I played here, but I don't know that it was the best. Maybe rook to b8, I think, is the other way they played this position now, sometimes after king to b1. I have to look into the theory. Um, but, I, but I played e5 because this line is, is still... It's still kind of fun, and honestly, if White just takes everything as he did here, I think this line doesn't really, this line doesn't really scare me as far as not playing um, the right theory against King B1 because I think Black gets usually pretty good compensation in these positions where the whole Queen side has been uh, taken to open up these files. Of course, taking this Rook on E8 fails to Bishop of Five. It's kind of the common tactic in these lines, and fails, I guess, is kind of a strong word because it's 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 definitely playable for White. I mean, you have the two Rooks for the Queen, but here, in this case, black normally gets the compensation um, that white wants. So, All right, so we've got some other stronger players coming in. We've played a lot of the uh, those who tweeted at us. Let's let's go for a little best two of three here against our boy Uni123. He's no stranger to the bullet brawl. You know he loves it. He loves the chance to uh, humiliate me on TV. So let's do this thing. We've played a lot of these uh, little uh, scotch games here in this line. Not our first rodeo, so to speak, in this line. I'm bringing the knight to f3, and the idea is that I'm supporting e5 so that I can try to play like f5. Here I'm sort of playing for the big center. I guess I'll take it, even though it's a little awkward now. Um, it's a little awkward now. But I'm hoping that the pawn weaknesses will make up for the fact that I've given my opponent the bishop here. That's kind of what I'm hoping for. Yeah, he plays there, which makes sense. I'm going to attack him and then and then put my knight on e5, where he's happy. He's very happy on e5, believe it or not, my knight. I don't know why, he just likes those kind of squares. And I'm always like, you silly knight, 
you just love those squares. And he's like, yeah, I do. Leave me alone. And then I'm like having a conversation about things I say to my pieces. And then everyone is reminded why they think Danny's a crazy weirdo. Yeah, and then life goes on. I played knight to g4 so I can play queen to e5. I'd like to eliminate his chances to checkmate me, right? On the h file. I don't like it when they do that. I don't like it when they mate me, yeah? Um, okay, he wants to be weird. Fine. Fine. Oh, you're threatening You're threatening mate and bake, so I can't allow that. That would have been bad. Ah, but I tricked you. I knew that move was coming because I had queen e6 check. He thought I missed it. Well, he was wrong. Well, he was wrong. See, the key was I, I saw that he played queen h4. Immediately, I saw that he played queen h4 with the idea of taking here. Um, and so I was going to play some random move to trick him into doing it. But what I forgot he was threatening, like if I had played this, can everyone see how he checkmates me? Three, two, one. Queen takes h3 is uh, check and then mate because the pawn is pinned by the bishop. Pinned pieces do not always protect perfectly. That's a lot of peas. I did that on purpose. You got a PP on the PP. That's pile up, pile, wait, pile pieces on the pinned piece. That's how you win pinned pieces. You pile up on them. Anyway, um, so I saw that threat right away to have queen e6, so I kind of tricked him. I'm sorry, Uni. I know. That was a dirty trick. That was a dirty, dirty trick, but I did it. I did it. I dirty tricked you. I don't know what to say. It happened. Life goes on. The Blumenfeld Gambit. Here we go. We're taking on e6 if he takes it. Mainline shenanigans. No, he doesn't want to do that. He plays this way. I feel like this isn't my first rodeo in this line. Although I don't always know if I play it the right way. I don't always know if I played it the right way. But I'm just going to play some solid developing moves and not get too greedy. Although I will get greedy now. I will get greedy now. That is a pawn. Fool me once. Shame on you. Give me the pawn twice, and I'll take it. All right. Um, G6. We are not too worried about that. Not too worried about the dark squares here. Okay. Opening up that file is certainly something I'm okay with. I will, uh, yeah, I'll offer a trade of the knights. In an attempt to uh, continue it and simplify the position, continue to simplify it, because I'm up a lot of pawns, up a lot of pawns, so I, I don't have to be too worried about anything in that regard. Although I probably shouldn't have gone for that tactic right away. Might have been better just to play h6 first, because I don't think he saw this 92 check coming. The key, everybody, was that he couldn't take, because I'd be mating him. So probably I had I could have done that a little bit better, but as we've said, this it doesn't look like it matters in this line. Looks like we are still achieving a pretty good position, and with it, a mating net that I set up. Shake and bake, and I helped. It's the easy bake oven. All you got to do is put your knight on f3 and then your pawn on g4. And that's an easy bake oven. That creates a nice little hot spot for the king. You just put some pepper on it, some salt, and throw it in the oven, you bake it, and then you got a nice little treat in the afternoon, all right? That's right. That's an easy bake oven, also known as a mating net. On the bullet barrel, you're welcome. Thank you, everybody, for coming here today. I don't know exactly what got me into this Alabama accent, but I like it. You see, Texas is a little more, it's a little more short, right? It's like a, I'm going to tell you what, ain't no such thing as global warmification, kind of like that. But Alabama's got a little bit more of a draw to it, a little more southern, southern draw. They talk a little bit softer and they're a little bit sweeter in their, in their tone, you know? I like to think of it, it's like a comparison to Australia and New Zealand. Like Australians are like, right, Absolutely. They're going to draw it out with wallabies and kangaroos, and, and they're going to talk about the outback, whereas New Zealand is a little more cut off. Right, good eye. New Zealand, yep. Right, good eye. Like that. Like, they're a little more, it's like a little more slang. They, they're a little more up-tempo in their tone. I study accents for a living. I know. It's not a waste of time or anything. Nobody thinks I'm weird because I do it. That's, a, you know, so don't even worry about that. No one's judging me about it. No one's no one's really irritated about it either. Ooh, really? Put the knight on b5. Um, the problem is, if we head to the end game, I think uh, I 
think his structure is worse enough for me to have pretty decent winning chances, actually. Um, Uh-oh. Unless I lose my pony. I have to be very careful now. I have to be very, very careful not to lose the pony. We'll play f6 and solidify that knight. Now we got a different type of mating net. Come over here. All right? Wallabies. Right. Yeah. Right. Good eye. Good eye. Like, it's a little more like that, you know, for New Zealand. Play knight d5. Play here. Take it. We did it. We took the best of three. I haven't lost any games yet. I'm feeling pretty good. All right, I got to take on Chess King T, another member of our community who does an awesome job helping out with just about everything. And uh, he actually does a lot of QA for us that is very useful, testing out products and uh, working on working on bug testing our V3 redesign. So Mr. Mr. Chess King T, Tyler, we are more than appreciative to you. And uh, here we go. He loves QA. Not my favorite part of the day. More of a necessary evil when you're designing the world's most awesome chess products. you got to test them out and make sure they work. Deal with it, Danny. I don't want to deal with it, Danny. You're talking to yourself again, Danny. All right, focus. Anyway, but, uh, but Tyler loves it, and he does a great job at it. That is the truth. I'm going to protect the knight and then bring the queen up for a little bit of a mating net, a little party. Okay. I think he thought I was going to take with the knight. Maybe forgot that that was not a forced option for me. I didn't have to take with the knight. So so that's a problem. Check. Always check it might be mate. In this case, it turns out to be true. All right. Thank you, Tyler. All right, let's go look for let's go look for a real strong title player before we bring this thing to a close. A lot of challenges coming in right now. I don't even know. I'm not gonna be able to get to everybody. Holden two two two, Ching Chang Chong three, Teddy the Queen, Expert Phoenix, Brian Josh, Joe Garcia. You are all now within my subconscious memory because I said your name out loud. That's how my memory works. I will get to you for sure. If not right now, then in a future week. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, let's go see who's who's currently enjoying the live chess flavor that is that is chess.com we'll seek a one minute game see if anybody's looking to jump on board and embarrass me we can't let me go through a whole bullet brawl by winning every game certainly not certainly not we got to have somebody play me who's going to take me down this guy looks like he might be able to do it estacio maestre estacio maestre i don't know something so we're going to play a uh, typical typical Tiger Pierce. That's what this line is called. With the bishop coming out to g5 early. We've got a big center, and we know how to use it. And that's not meant to be like, a, the, it's not the size that counts, it's how you use it. Actually, that's exactly what it was meant to be. A funny reference to that. I don't know what he's doing with that queen on b7, but I like it. I'm encouraging him to follow this plan because it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. So go for it, buddy. We'll take there. Yeah, he actually somehow survives that more than I uh, more than I even thought he would. To be honest, but he did. He survived the uh, the tactics for the time being. But e7 is hanging along with all kinds of other threats. So I'm going to take this one with check. Ooh, I thought I was going to just be mating him, but he, he survives it. He survives it for now. We should just bring everybody over here to attack the queen. Just get everybody involved, you know. Take here. Maybe give check on e6 next. Come up to the diagonal, see how he wants to deal with that. Take on b4. All right, we took it. Let's see if we can keep it going here. All right, we're going to play the e5 against the English. He likes this stuff. I know he does. I can feel it. 
I can feel that he likes this line. But I like when I get d5 in this line too because it's a common trick leading to equality for black, which is my favorite type of thing to happen out of the opening. Get equality quickly, I always say. You have to be equal before you can be better. Did you know that? That's like one of those weird chess philosophical things. Kind of like your priorities are not what you say, but what you do. Also, a little bit of philosophy for you today. So if you're out there thinking, oh yeah, my priorities are this. Your priorities are what you do, not what you say. Actions speak louder than words. Try and get it, okay? It's about bringing the troops home. Let's get this work over here. We're going to give check. Now, where is the win? Ay ay ay, right? I feel like I'm just going to go over here and sack. Look at that. Fun town. Population us, bros. I'm going to sack so I can get my knight in to be four, which is going to threaten all these awesome checks. Loving it. Actually, now, now that he played it that way, I'm just going to give check and go pick up my piece back. I mean, it probably taken B4 was just as winning, actually. But uh, this way seems to be more fun. Ooh, he, uh, he doesn't care about getting the queens off the board. He doesn't care about getting the queens off the board. Do I care about his check? I kind of do, actually. I'll defend against it. I kind of do care, actually. Play there. Go after the pawn. Give the check, the check of my life. Oh, where's the mate? Right? Where's the goods? Oh, there we go. That'll work. That'll work. Let's do it again. Let's run this thing back one more time. Let's spin this thing right round like a record, baby. Right round. Whoa, that's a little strange. Uh, hmm. Never played this exact type of position in this Tiger Pier, so it's kind of kind of fun, I guess. Something a little weird, right? Exciting for the kids. Uh, he's got a pretty decent attack on here. I'm not sure I I played that exactly the best way. Maybe I should switch to a more positional approach now. You know what I mean? Switch to something a little more positional to make sure I hold everything down. Play h5, see if he wants g5. He doesn't. That's probably a smart thing. Because if he plays g5, then he's, uh, he's really locking in that bishop. Okay, but that's fine too. That's fine with me. We'll take everything. Maybe even take f7 next. Yeah, we get a discovery on the rook and threaten queen g8. Which should be, should be muy bueno. I'm feeling, feeling like I'm playing pretty well today. You know, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying our time together. I feel like we're all, we're all doing good. All right. Well, uh, one more good match at least. I know a lot of the new game challenges are still pouring in. A lot of players I didn't get to. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and play you, JFK. 2012, because you've been here more than once, and I know you've been patiently spamming me. You know, you're such a patient spammer, just spamming me with challenges. I love that about you. Love how patient you are when you spam me with challenges. My favorite thing about you, actually, is your patience. No, it's actually my patience with you. What? I don't know. I forget what we were talking about. You know, she was talking about me not listening to her feelings. I don't know. I wasn't really paying attention, that kind of thing. So we're going to play Woe Town. Weird development now. Uh, uh, I don't think I necessarily played this that well, to be honest with you. Where did I, where did I go wrong there? I'm going to have to try to figure that one out. And I'm down on time. I don't like my position and I don't like my clock. Two things I don't like here. Hmm. Guarding my pawn so I can play e5 to undermine his bishop. That was my idea. 
Okay, we'll take it. Attack his rook, maybe. Probably doesn't do much. We'll go guard that G-pawn, just make sure we're not going to get mated. That's kind of what I'm thinking right now. Go after his pawns, perhaps. Ooh, also something I'm not really happy I did. That last move, G6, that wasn't right. Giving him too many chances on the dark squares, though I'm hoping it shouldn't matter. I'm hoping I should still be winning here. A3 takes advantage of the fact that he can't take it. All right. That was close. JFK 2012 did well. I'm not sure what I did wrong there. So one of the ideas in this opening, everybody, is that Black is sacrificing the B-pawn. Um, okay, you play C6 next, but you've already sacked the B-pawn. The point is that Black is trying to get a rapid development for the minor pieces in order to take advantage of the queen being here. You know, so some ugly lines, like if white just takes everything and, and black gets, like, everything he wants, then he gets all the pieces on the light squares and on the C file and just gets lots of great compensation. But in, in this game, my opponent played um, this A4 move, which just doesn't seem very, doesn't seem right to be able to just weaken that pawn there. And so I played bishop E7 and then took and... And... Uh, Feels like I should be getting something natural. But it, it's kind of a principled approach by him. I mean, the pawn on b5 keeps my knight out of these squares. So that prevents me from developing as quickly as I'd like, honestly. So it's interesting. Maybe I just play d6 and develop the knight here and here. I mean, if he develops the bishop, of course, the g2 pawn falls. If he goes here, I have options to take and double the pawns. But but I, I wonder if I can get some compensation by some normal developing. Um so I don't know. The other option is to play knight to d5 and then f5, which happens in a lot of these positions where black is over-controlling the light squares and a chance to maybe get get a launch pad going for the attack on the king's side. Also something that happens here, but I don't like how irritating this pawn on b5 is. Honestly, it's just weird that it slows down my development so much. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look into you, Billy Blue, into this little system. Okay. Well, we're going to have one more chance to take on a strong title player if they are out there waiting, watching, and they'd like to jump on in to the party. See if somebody wants to bring it in for the real thing before we before we rock out, you know, before we jump ship. Hope everybody's having fun. Again, you can follow me on Twitter. Look for chances to get involved in the game. Obviously, you saw today that if you tweet at me during the show and tell me your username, it kind of increases your chances of playing, at least earlier it did. And then I was like, oh, I'm done with that, you know. Um, all right, well, uh, I'm going to try to see if there's anybody looking. If there's anybody looking to, to jump in. Who wants to jump in to the party? Who wants to jump in the party? Yeah, I've already challenged Yaakov. Let me, let me see if he wants to do it again. Yakov's always down to crush me in a best of five on live TV. It's like his favorite thing to do. But not today, apparently. He hasn't accepted the challenge. Fide Master, chilling guy, trying to bring it in. Bring it in for some big games and uh, not a lot of takers. But okay, we got one title player as far as the titles on our side looking to do this thing, and that is Petro Sionic. So we will, uh, we'll, we'll bring on... We'll bring on Petro and see what he wants to do today. Aha! So we get weirdness. My favorite kind. My favorite kind of weirdness. Completely unsound weirdness, if you're wondering. Like, what, what is his favorite kind? Oh, it's when he plays completely horrible moves. Yep, that's, that's his favorite kind. Right? Good to know, right? I'm sure you guys are happy to have that knowledge. All right. Ooh, let's play e4. Let's open this thing up. Let's just do it. Let's just do it. You know, let's Nike this position and just do it. Feels like there's just some craziness going on. Uh, I think that's pretty good. So I'll take it. I'll take that queen. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, that was a fun way to sack a pawn. 
fun way to sack a pawn and blow open the center. That's what you do when your opponent doesn't castle. You go after him, everybody. You open the center. You're welcome. You're welcome, world. First ever chess show about rap songs and dinosaurs. Did you know that that's what this show's about? It's about rap songs and dinosaurs. I know, you never would have guessed, right? But now, now, you, now you would. I don't know what happened here. Nobody knows what happened here. <laughs> <laughs> he played a horrible blunder and I didn't even and I didn't pay attention enough to get it. So that's what happened. That's what happened. Wow. It's like does anybody know what's going on here? I certainly don't. I'm just going to take everything. I don't quite know what else to do. Don't quite know what else to do. We'll take it all. Just take it all. Take everybody. Take everybody. Offer queen trades. Take things. This one's going to stay on my grave... On my, uh, what is it called? Headstone? Offer queen trades and take things. So deep. So deep. All right. Well, this is fun. This is a fun one. All right, we'll take there. Maybe just push the pawn. We'll give check. We'll push again. There's no mate. There is no mate. So that's fun. Do it again. Again. Who says that again? Oh, yeah, that's Morpheus when Neo's like, oh, my God, I can't do this. And he's like, again. That's what happened. Get a big center. Big, big center. Okay. Making sense. Everybody's making sense here. Trying to repeat or retreat so that there was no double pawns, which kind of makes that bishop awkward, which is fun. Do I really worry about this? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm, I'm super worried about it. I think we'll just sack this pawn now to get this development going. You know? Hmm. I'd like to take there. Huh. But I can't. In the end, I don't get enough. So that's not good. Didn't work out for me that whole uh, that whole little thing that just happened there. Did not work out for the best. But we're still hoping to get an attack going, right? I'm still hoping for it. Ooh, that's interesting. He's gonna sack and then mate me. That's what he wanted to do. It was very, very mean of him, actually. It was super duper mean of him, it was. Trying to bring more pressure over there. Oh, he takes. Not enough time, unfortunately. Sorry, buddy. Good games, man. All right, well, I think we're going to bring the bullet ball to a close. A lot of challenges. Bart Core, Calm Lore, Scothium, Swish and Chug. Swish and Chug, I like that. <laughs> Instead of switching to the killer six nine five one, you're all beautiful. You're all beautiful. Beautiful usernames. Hoping to catch up with you soon, probably on uh, next week's bullet brawl. Uh, bullet Vinic, I think we've played before, so we're not going to play right now. Not this moment. Peace out, everybody. Tell your friends about this show and all of its glory. That you can learn things from bullet games and not be bored on a Wednesday afternoon. Hump day, right? Get over it.